Researchers are no longer working alone, confined to their labs. They need to collaborate and share knowledge with peers in Europe and beyond to advance specific questions within their fields of investigation. Europe needs more open spaces where people connect and ideas grow. And that is precisely what the COST programme does. We fund networks of researchers called COST Actions, which offer a free space to drive science forward. How can you benefit from a COST Action? First of all, COST Actions can help you to develop your own research by drawing on resources from other countries. A COST Action is good for your career development. You will expand your professional network and learn from experienced peers and researchers from other disciplines and countries. Cost actions also contribute to the scientific community and society as a whole by discovering new talent. Cost complements your research by supporting you in establishing diverse networks of valuable contacts that help you address your research goals. We provide the funding for cost actions to organize meetings, workshops and conferences, short-term scientific visits to overseas institutions and laboratories, participation in training schools and dissemination activities like publications and websites. So are you eligible for a cost action? Let's find out. You can create or join a network in any scientific field from social sciences to the most technological topic. What's more, cost actions can be interdisciplinary so experts from different areas of expertise may join in. All kinds of institutions can take part. Public, private, academia, NGOs, and you can apply at any stage of your career. At the proposal stage, you will need to gather experts from at least seven cost countries working in a field of common interest. At least half of these countries must be what we call inclusiveness target countries, where research infrastructures are still developing. Today, 39 countries are members of COST and over half of these are inclusiveness target countries. If your proposal is selected, you'll receive funding for four years. And if new partners or experts want to join during that period, no problem. COST is open, diverse and bottom-up. Why not discover more on our website? You can propose your own COST action or browse more than 200 ongoing ones. Let's unlock the full potential of science. So, good morning, everyone. We are really honored to welcome you in this final conference of the Restore Action. Um, I'm Carlo Battisti. I'm uh, really honored to welcome you together with all the other friends. I'm the chair of the Coast Action Restore, Rethinking Sustainability Towards a Regenerative Economy. Um, I'm uh, chairing this section uh, on behalf of URAC Research. URAC Research is a research center with uh, a dozen institutes uh, in South Tyrol, Italy, with more than 500 researchers working in different fields of the uh, environment and science uh, research. Uh, and more specifically, this section uh, is uh, within the framework of the Institute for Renewable Energy. Um, today, we will uh, uh, basically uh, show the um, highlights uh, and the findings of uh, four years of uh, our action. Clearly, as you know, our action has been really focused on uh, how to change the rules of sustainability for the built environment. We know we are really, really living in a very critical situation. It's, it's not, I think it's not needed to, uh, to tell uh, these things. Uh, if you just had the possibility, the chance to take a look at this uh, great uh, documentary on Netflix, Our Planet, um, uh, and we know, we perfectly know the story. So we are re really living in a critical situation. And we know that uh, the built environment uh, is responsible for uh, a huge part of um, uh, these environmental uh, um, issues, this climate emergency. And um, given that we are all, uh, as I suppose, uh, um, members of this uh, economical sector, I think we really need to, um, to address uh, this climate emergency issue in a much more effective way. Um, it's, basically, this was the rationale behind uh, uh, the uh, starting of uh, the Restore Action uh, from the very beginning, four years ago. 
Um, so we we noticed that um, in the also uh, basically in the latest uh, decades, uh, our progress in addressing the climate emergency in a more effective way has been really barely visible. Uh, even if uh, we uh, adopted uh, green buildings, uh, very high performing buildings, we are still talking about um, buildings that are really impacting somehow on the environment. So, uh, and, and again, we are not seeing any really uh, concrete uh, progress on this. So we really need to uh, transform uh, our uh, mindset uh, and to change the paradigm to shift the paradigm, uh, thinking to uh, different type of buildings, buildings that can really be autonomous, uh, sufficient, uh, and uh, addressing the sustainability in a different way. As a matter of fact, sustainability is still giving back uh, to the environment what we are taking off, so the sort of neutral point uh, in the middle of this diagram. Are we able to create uh, restorative buildings or regenerative buildings? Uh, that can really address uh, in a much more concrete way uh, the issues we were uh, speaking about. So this was basically the idea uh, behind uh, Restore. As you can see, this is the path we tried to, uh, to run through in these four years. So basically, um, starting from a, a business as usual situation, uh, a less bad scenario, uh, going towards uh, a more restorative, a more regenerative environment, uh, in, in other terms, to uh, trying to do more good uh, for the built environment. So this is basically the idea. Are we able to conceive the built environment uh, in a totally different uh, uh, way? As, as we noticed, this is a really a huge uh, change uh, in the mindset and has been really a very uh, powerful also input for our research activities during these four years and we hope that we, we did something uh, meaningful in the end. Um, the, the idea of Restore really started uh, already something like five years ago um, within a group of small group of professionals. Uh, all of you are uh, today join the call. So uh, I'm really happy to remind uh, our first uh, step at the beginning. Um, and we took advantage of this um, uh, cost uh, um, framework, this, this great opportunity provided by the European Union to fund the research activities. Um, basically creates the opportunity for networking between researchers and professionals and practitioners across Europe. So we applied for, uh, for the call, we've been rejected the first time, and then uh, we learned the lesson and we try again and then, um, and then here we are and the, the, the action is going towards uh, its end, uh, the action will end uh, on the end of April next year. So this is the final conference and we are summarizing the uh, results uh, we uh, developed so far, so far and uh, there will be other um, I would say months for dissemination uh, in the following year. So uh, again, the restore action has really to do with the change, a paradigm shift uh, for the uh, restorative sustainability in the built environment, basically working to, these are the main goals of our action, working to uh, increase knowledge uh, and uh, transfer knowledge between uh, resources and countries across Europe, creating new approaches, new processes, new technologies, Establishing uh, a, a huge European network uh, now counting on more than 160 uh, members from uh, 40 countries, uh, including uh, also some uh, international partners as New Zealand uh, and United States. Uh, thinking also to, uh, how to collaborate beyond the end of the action, working a lot uh, in introducing, implementing this new criteria into the educational curriculum at the university level, at the high school level, and so forth and so on. Because this, this is really one uh, crucial part of our action because uh, we can change uh, the, 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 the rules, we can try to change the rules, but uh, they will not be effective unless we are really able to uh, create uh, contents for, uh, for education in our schools uh, in order to um, create a new um, uh, awareness in the professionals of tomorrow. 
And clearly, this approach has been possible only throughout a uh, multidisciplinary uh, disciplinary um, collaboration between uh, among different topics, different uh, branches of uh, of research, uh, because um, we, we can't take a reductionist approach. Uh, uh, the 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 participation, the expertise of all the uh, research sectors are really uh, very important because the. The topic we have been really dealing uh, with and this four years is really huge, as you can imagine. When we uh, talk about the built environment, what does it mean? It means a lot of things. It means uh, uh, how we manage the resources, how we are uh, thinking to a uh, carbon neutral future, how we are creating healthy environment space, are we are addressing uh, equity and not just equality, are we are creating also um, opportunities for uh, education. So uh, one of the concepts that we've been hearing a lot this year that we are living in now more than 90% of our time, our daily time uh, within uh, built spaces, uh, in the spaces. So the way we are addressing these spaces is also uh, very important. So um, the maybe uh, an interesting characteristic of a restore that um, uh, born as an action has been transformed very soon into a project. So we uh, try to really manage it um, a, a, as, a, as a typical, say, uh, European uh, research collaborative uh, project in order to um, uh, go quite fast towards some concrete results um, and possibly creating also the conditions for uh, um, keeping the network alive also beyond the end of the action. Again, basically all the countries in Europe are represented in this network something like uh, 100 uh, universities, organizations, uh, um, and also uh, industry representatives, uh, consulting firms, design firms, and so forth and so on. Mainly from the academic world, but not only. Clearly, we try to keep the different, uh, uh, say, angles of uh, this collaboration always very, very active. And, um, and again, we have also a map online where you can find all the, um, uh, let's say, the, the, the organization members uh, of, uh, um, of, the, uh, of this network. Um, we are also welcoming today uh, one of our, Paula, one of our members from New Zealand. Uh, so the the uh, and also thank into consideration your time zone. This is very much appreciated. So the um, the, um, the the network has been trying also to expand our uh, radius of action uh, across the world. Uh, also throughout also some short short term scientific missions. We will uh, talk uh, in a bit on on this. Uh, one of the goal was also to increase the collaboration between uh, uh, less and more advanced from a research perspective. Uh, countries in Europe. This is one of the, let's say, main um, goals uh, more in general from uh, the uh, Coast Association. This is clearly very important. And we, I, I can I can ensure you, we definitely noticed uh, how high is, is the value of this collaboration between countries in Europe and um, also taking into account all different expertise and uh, experiences from different countries, different regions uh, in Europe. This has been really uh, definitely an added value uh, throughout the action and in the end. Uh, um, with, the, with the very good gender balance, uh, this is also important. Uh, we are really quite close to a 50-50 distribution uh, and this, this is clearly a very, very important uh, topic uh, uh, as well. So we are also quite uh, proud uh, of that. Um, again, a multidisciplinary approach, uh, more than say uh, 40 different expertise uh, represented in the action. This was very important. You can address this huge topic without taking into account also the economic aspect, the social aspects. Clearly, we tried to do it, even if the majority of us were more um, keen on, uh, let's say, uh, environmental and uh, architectural engineering topics. Topics, but uh, we we definitely realize that this uh, way is the only way uh, to address uh, this uh, global issue in a more effective way. And thanks for all of your participation so far, uh, you members of the Restore Networks uh, in representing young countries. This has been really a, a dramatic experience uh, for me personally. I think for all of us, uh, this is a picture from uh, last year. Um, 
clearly in-person meeting. It was possible uh, uh, for the midterm conference. Uh, where we have been uh, also addressing how restore combines, for instance, with the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. This is also uh, a, a global uh, huge challenge, uh, and um, we try to understand uh, how our contributes was possible also to address this, um, these topics, these goals. And uh, thanks to the uh, funding coming from uh, the Coast Association, we have been able to uh, use different tools um, so meetings, uh, working groups, uh, working group meetings, uh, uh, dissemination activities, uh, training schools, uh, we will talk a bit more on this uh, very soon, uh, conferences, workshops, uh, short-term scientific missions, uh, uh, clearly a lot of communication tools, uh, websites, social media, publications, uh, books. Uh, uh, we, we try to uh, basically to exploit all the um, possibilities uh, given uh, by the uh, from, by the Coast Association to run this action, uh, passing through uh, five different work packages uh, that are basically uh, related uh, one to uh, another. So starting from uh, uh, definition of sustainability at the beginning, and then passing through a different approach in the design activities, uh, the construction side, the construction management, the operations, uh, how to rethink technologies in order to. Uh, create this type of, uh, let's say, different buildings, and also in the end, how to scale up these concepts to a larger scale, to a district or to a city uh, level. Uh, I mentioned publications. We are really very proud uh, about these booklets coming uh, from um, the, the working groups, from the work packages. Basically, each work, uh, working group produced one uh, booklet. Uh, there is the uh, latest one from the working group five coming very soon and we are finalizing also uh, the final book coming from uh, the from the action that will be uh, available uh, beginning of next year so this this is also a very good opportunity for us to disseminate what we did training schools has been really uh, let's say uh, instrumental for uh, our activities uh, uh, each uh, war package each working group uh, had uh, one uh, specific uh, dedicated training school uh, with the participation of, uh, let's say, hundreds of um, professionals and researchers from all over Europe and, and abroad. This also has been a really a fantastic experience and, um, and we definitely realized the, how powerful uh, is the uh, collaboration of these young professionals uh, in, for this type of uh, activities. I mentioned the short-time scientific missions. Let's say we travel a lot, meaning that our researchers, our members travel to explore um, different, uh, say, opportunities for research uh, in different parts of Europe uh, and also abroad. Um, and uh, we are thanking all of these researchers, all of the practitioners, also the hosting organizations. Uh, without your help, uh, uh, it wasn't possible clearly to create all of these things. But at, in the end, we we uh, had a very, very uh, powerful and um, interesting insight also coming from these specific research activities. Uh, we traveled a lot, I mentioned, uh, let's say uh, before uh, uh, this February, more or less. Um, so one of our main concern was also on how to address uh, uh, the, all the CO2 emissions coming from our action. So uh, believe me, we've been thinking and discussing on this point for uh, something like uh, two years. And uh, we are still, let's say, working to, uh, to offset this, imp this impact. I would like to thank the uh, CO2 offsetting team, the uh, CO2 offset strategy team, let's say, Martin Brown and Lisanne, uh, having got to uh, work on creating, uh, creating a strategy for us uh, to reduce our impact on one side, and on the other hand, to offset the, uh, the, our emissions. Uh, we are basically uh, quite good right now. I think we have been able to offset uh, uh, more than 50% of our emissions. We are still like uh, four months to come and uh, uh, in order to complete uh, our uh, path on this. Uh, so our greatest ambition is really to make uh, this network the first uh, uh, carbon neutral action uh, within the uh, cost framework. As you know, uh, we, uh, we are all part of a big European uh, mission, a big European challenge. So the idea to uh, 
um, to have uh, Europe as a first carbon neutral continent by 2050. And this is clearly uh, where basically um, uh, our action also uh, lies. And this is something that, for instance, we've been able to um, uh, to contribute uh, to, um, also thanks to the Coast Association, uh, um, sending some information uh, to do the to the uh, organization, uh, basically the, the the team and the the body working on creating the new rules for the new Green Deal. Um, a big thanks to our uh, speakers today. First of all, our keynote speakers, Joey Pringle and Emmanuel Delanois. Thanks a lot for joining us uh, today and uh, provide your experience. Uh, I know that Joy is uh, is aiming to have uh, the uh, first factory a company really uh, carbon neutral or maybe more the most sustainable uh, or most regeneratively sustainable company in the world. And on the other hand, uh, I think Emmanuel Delanois will be speaking about uh, how to um, adapt the concept of permaculture into a, into the economical world, into the economic environment. This is also a very interesting uh, topic. So I really we are really encouraging you to attend the old day in order to uh, to listen to these very interesting speeches. And thanks a lot to all the speakers today, uh, to, to, to all of you that we see you in the, in the picture. We have been able to uh, introduce uh, yourself individually during the day. Um, and this is the program. You can uh, find more details uh, also on our uh, website uh, with the, the, the detailed program uh, of the conference. A garment factory has collapsed in Bangladesh, once again calling into question the safety standards at the factories. The Rescuers owner of the Rana Plaza factory complex in Bangladesh has been charged with murder. A Chinese company that has made shoes for the Ivanka Trump brand denies allegations of excessive overtime and low wages. A factory fire in India killed at least 43 people Sunday. Look, this is going to keep happening as long as we let it. So we need to show clothing brands not just that we care, but why they should. Whilst the fashion industry has strived to become more sustainable over the course of the last 10 years, manufacturers have struggled to keep pace with the speed of change required. Our answer to this is Vishin Factory. I'm Joe Pringle, founder of Vishin, OEM and ODM manufacturer that specializes in luxury vegan leather and premium recycled synthetics, bags and accessories. Our goal at Vishin is to become one of the greenest factories on the planet by living and breathing five core values. We want to reduce the quantity of global output by making high quality, innovative, long-lasting products. Our focus is on the circular economy and working with material suppliers that take these and turn them into this. Certifications and audits are a crucial part of the social compliance process. But we plan on going above and beyond by providing transparency on everything. And I mean everything. Veganism is at the forefront of our values, so we promote plant-based living wherever possible. To take the pressure off these guys, we plan on working with materials such as cactus, apple, pineapple and mushroom. Our desire for doing things differently stretches above and beyond our green manufacturing goals. From beach cleanups to tree planting initiatives, we plan on investing our time and our revenues into supporting global and local outreach projects outside of our day-to-day -day factory operations. For long-lasting positive change to take hold, we believe there needs to be a shift in global consciousness. Through Transcendental Meditation, we hope to help raise awareness and encourage people to have a more balanced relationship with nature. Vision collaboration is key. For the fashion industry to change for the better, meaningful collaboration and shared culture is fundamental. We want to work with brands that share our core values, our philosophy on accountability, and our desire for a greener future. So if this is you, get in touch, and we look forward to going on this journey together. A garment factory has collapsed in Bangladesh. Once again, calling into question. That wasn't supposed to happen. Joey, good morning. Good morning. It's Hi, a, a, huge, 
a huge pleasure to introduce, uh, welcome you and introduce you. Hello to everyone. Conference for Restored. Hi, thanks for having me. Joey, I'll let, I'll let you kick off with, with your story uh, of how you arrived at, uh, at Vision and how sure. you uh, ended up with a vision to create yeah. the Greenness Factory. Okay. Um, well, yeah, it's been a roller coaster to say the least, but um, my background starts here in the UK. Originally, I'm from North London. I studied industrial design at Nottingham Trent University. Um, I lived two years in Australia where I worked as a, a designer for a company designing backpacks in Melbourne. And then uh, it was a goal of mine to basically get out of the UK and get citizenship in another country. And I couldn't go back to Australia. So I moved to Canada. I moved to Vancouver, the west coast of Canada. And um, the first four years in Canada, um, kind of needed to, to just survive. So I um, found carpentry as a, as a career and I was building houses and um, kind of a, a framing carpenter. And uh, four years in construction and uh, I was really enjoying it, but it got to a point where um, I became a resident in Canada and I wanted to, um, to get back into, into the, back into the fashion industry. That's where, um, where my passion was, was in, in, in designing backpacks and accessories. And uh, after four years of being a carpenter, I became a resident and um, I decided to make the shift back into, into product design. And um, the last four years in Canada, I worked for um, two very reputable, more so outdoor environmentally conscious companies. Um, the latter was called Tentree, so T-E-N-T-R-E-E. -E -E, and Tentree plants trees for every product they sell. Um, very, very incredibly sustainably driven company that aligned with my values. Um, and my job at Tentry was head of accessories. So I was in charge of designing, development, sourcing, um, social compliance for all the accessories categories like backpacks, headwear, wallets, socks, um, anything from an accessory standpoint I would cover. Um, and my job at Tentry was responsible for about 10 factories located across China and Vietnam. And it was on a trip in 2018 where I was um, visiting China and uh, my job was to, um, was to look at the factories in person, make sure they're being socially compliant outside of design and development, just ensuring that the product was getting made ethically and um, the factories were clean and they were being responsible and they were supporting us with our sustainability goals. Um, however, Working in Asia, it, is, it was very challenging from an Asian owner perspective to get them to understand how important sustainability is in a, from a design perspective. And um, it was always it was always kind of like banging your head against the wall when you're, you're going on these visits and these trips and you're talking to them about, can you source recycled polyester? Can you source organic cotton? And it was very foreign. It was very foreign to a lot of these owners. So a lot of these trips, you'd come back and almost exhausted from, from visiting China, just knowing kind of how far behind they were with how quickly the planet needed to change. So I was on, I was on one trip in 2018 where um, I was going to visit one of our factories. At the time, this factory was making our wallet collection and this factory specialized in animal leather goods. So leather handbags, leather wallets, these types of things and knowing that there are a leather goods specialist, it was just the value that didn't sit well with our company because being sustainably conscious, working with someone who um, specializes in animal leather, we understand that like, it's just the animal industry is kind of going against the rules of sustainability and, um, and climate change. So the plan was to meet this factory in Guangzhou and um, to let them know that we're going to move our business away from them. Um, one, because of their values with leather and two, um, they were costing a lot. And there was a few other red flags from a factory perspective that we just, it wasn't a fit for us. So I visited this factory and um, I explained to them in person how we're going to have to move the business away. And um, the owner of this factory understood everything I was saying. And he actually came back to me and said, um, please don't move the business away. Um, 
right now we're trying to our, our hardest to become more greener with our vision and he went on to explain that he's a converted buddhist and being a buddhist working with leather goods it's a, it's a huge catch-22 for someone who who practices buddhism so he was explaining how he has this vision to start a greener factory model something that was really going to be compliant with the planet and the industry and um he explained his values and um, I was really taken back. Um, it was incredible to, to meet someone finally in China that really understood kind of our vision, my values and understood the need for the planet to, to, for businesses to change. So it was, it was, it was incredible to, to hear this guy speak. And um, I said to him, his vision to start a greener factory was, was so incredible that I would love to, um, I would, I would love to join him and give him my advice and consult for him. So we left it for a year. I went back to Canada and I consulted for him um, back in Canada, kind of finding him more sustainable materials to use in his operation, finding more brands um, that would be a fit for his, for his factory. And uh, a year went on and it came to um, a crossroads in my life where I was working for this incredible company, but, the company was growing very quickly and um, I was giving my heart to this business and I wasn't getting the, uh, the re rewards back that I thought I was, um, I was worth. And ultimately I've always wanted to work for myself and to make the biggest impact possible on the planet. Um, I just, I know it can only come from an individual standpoint because you can kind of, you can really go above and beyond um, being your own boss. You can kind of, it's a sky's the limit situation. So I said to myself, there's this consultant role with this factory that, that is going so well for this first year. And um, I was offered a promotion at my company. I needed to make a decision. Do I take this promotion and stay at my company in Canada or do I become a full-time consultant? So um, I flew back to China at the end of last year, 2019. And I proposed to this guy in China um, my vision for, for, for the factory and how I could be a full-time consultant for him and build this greener factory model. And um, I put it all on paper and I proposed it to him. And uh, he turned around and said, um, hey, like your vision for what he wants to do is, is so clear. And my experience is in sustainability from a design standpoint. I really understood what he wanted to do. I went kind of overboard with, with, with my vision and he simply just said, hey, I don't want you to be a consultant. I want you to be the owner of this factory. And um, at the time when he offered me ownership, it made, um, it made no sense for me to kind of go straight into ownership. My, my first question was like, how much money do you need for me to, to go into this partnership? And he answered saying he doesn't want any money from me. He just wants, he just wants me as a person to be the owner um, because of my values and my experience and my passion for, for what he wants to do. Um, secondly, um, he doesn't speak English. I don't speak Chinese. So there was a red flag right there from a communication standpoint. Um, up until this point, we've had a translator that does all the conversations for us. And we use obviously like WeChat and technology, but there's a couple of other things about relocating to China. Um, I was on the, the verge of becoming a Canadian citizen. I spent eight years in, in Canada to become a citizen. And I was like, am I ready to leave um, after all this hard work in Canada? So we talked about all these things on this trip and um, the stars really did align and um, the universe, it was all very, very serendipitous how this has all happened in my life. But Basically, um, my gut feeling was this is meant to be. And, um, and yeah, I decided there and then, just in December, just last year, that I'm going to um, quit my job in Canada. I'm going to become a citizen and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave and relocate to China. Um, it's, not, it's not the um, standard walk of life to kind of to get a citizenship in Vancouver, one of the most beautiful cities in the world, to, to relocate to China. So... It was, um, it was meant to be for me. And um, uh, I quit my job at the start of this year. And then I said to myself, prior to going to China, I'm gonna come back to the UK for just uh, for six months to see my, see my family. And then in October this year, I'll relocate to China and I'll start the factory. And then um, little did we know, 
at the time in March, obviously COVID hit, um, the world got put on shutdown, Mother Nature locked us all up, put us inside, yeah. told us to think about our actions, um, how we've been acting as a human race. And um, from a fashion perspective, the industry was really suffering prior to COVID. And um, I just said to myself, this is an, an incredible opportunity to, um, to kind of get this factory moving right now, um, explain what I'm trying to achieve with manufacturing. And um, I took it upon myself in the UK to, to launch the factory um, in May. So I launched everything in May. I built a website, I built an Instagram account, which is at Vision Factory. Um, I started networking, I started talking to brands, just seeing who was out there and who's interested in, um, in working with us. And if this is something that the industry wanted to see from a, from a change perspective, I was very confident that um, fashion needs to change quite dramatically and quite quickly. Um, from my experience working in Asia, factories are just not at the um, climate compliance standpoint to really go above and beyond. So I knew there was a gap in the market to really build a factory that could really push um, all these factors from, from a carbon offsetting perspective to sustainable um, product building to just every, every little aspect of the operation. I knew there was um, such potential. So I launched everything in May and then, um, and then, yeah, it really did snowball effect is for me. And um, the, the factory took off between May and now. I took on about 10 new clients already. And um, yeah, the story has been quite powerful. The way we're starting this, um, this factory vision is that through our current factory, which, which the, um, my business partner already owns in Guangzhou, we're gonna launch a new factory out of his current factory. And what we're simply going to do is over the next couple of years, we're going to fade, away, fade out all the leather goods part of the business. And we're going to bring in more vegan leathers, all sustainable materials. We're going to bring solely companies and brands that want to build sustainable product. And um, after two years, our goal is to kind of get to a point where our revenues are, are heavily shifted towards sustainable brands. And then after two years, we're, we're going to be looking at building our own factory. Um, uh, we want to build a, a building, a piece of architecture that is off the grid. Um, and then this is when I connected with Martin and this architectural world. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite inspirational to, to see what's happening in, from a building perspective. And I really want to build a factory that is... Um, a role model, not just for fashion, but for any building in, in manufacturing that with any values in place that you can build um, a building that is really an example of what needs to be on the planet right now. So that's our long-term <clears throat> our long -term goal. It's a big dream right now, but we're on the right path. And um, as I said, it launched it in May and uh, everything's been so well received. And um, yeah, it's exciting to, um, to take it from here. Sorry, Martin, my uh, phone's going off there. That's fine. That, that, that's great, Jerry. Th thanks for share sharing your, your story. There's a few questions co coming through from the, uh, the audience, but the, the first one I, I, I've got, um, and I know it's something we, we've talked about over the last few months. Can you just explain why you've put um, meditation, transcendental meditation, and mindfulness within your core values? Sure. So, um, just prior to my visit to China last year, I was at a point in my life where I needed um, a particular tool um, in my brain to kind of, um, I knew that moving to China and making this decision was so huge. I needed to be at the, um, the highest level of consciousness and my intuition had to be as, as high as possible. And um, I found meditation through, um, through my brother who took a course called Transcendental Meditation. Um, it's done wonders for him. Um, I've always been a very spiritual person. I've always believed, um, I don't necessarily believe in God, but I believe in the universe. I believe in the, there is an energy out there, like Mother Nature is an energy that is on the planet right now. And it, it, it is asking us questions and, and these types of things. 
and um, I found meditation and um, meditation really, um, it brought so much clarity to me on every, every aspect of life. Um, and simply put, um, without everyone, yeah. humanity being at a higher state of consciousness, um, we won't be able to make the positive changes that we need. So the five core values of Vishin are sustainability, transparency, um, veganism and a plant-based diet and giving back and offsetting. These are all five, four things that radiate under um, as a result of meditation and being at a higher state of consciousness. So when you look at the, um, all, the, all these things that we need to do as a human race to, um, to become more carbon neutral and to, to tackle climate change, all these things can't happen in silos. They can only happen holistically from a higher state of consciousness. So once the human race can get to that state, <clears throat> holistically, naturally, all these things, all these values and our intuition that will become higher, that naturally all these things will just start to, to serendipity, serendipity just happen for us um, with any walk of life from an individual standpoint, from a business standpoint. Um, I built the company going through a kind of a, a huge enlightenment wave of meditation. And um, yeah, it really did. It all came. It, I had so much clarity when, when building this company and it really all came back to um, just being at that higher state of consciousness and, and, and the key for us to, to get to that level, because if we're not at that level, um, the positive change that we need to happen just simply won't happen. Uh, totally agree, totally agree. Uh, yeah, so the question's coming in for you, Joey. There's, there's a question around bioplastic. Uh, sorry, yeah, bioplastics. Bioplastics. Um, What's the bioplastics in the fashion industry, um, high potential to handle better, better handle pollution problems. Um, from a plastic standpoint, um, yeah, we use a lot of recycled um, synthetics right now. Um, there's PU, which is um, traditionally in, in leather, is, um, is, is plastic, but it's, it's more chemical based. But we're trying to really shift our, um, our usage towards vegan leathers. So Apple, um, Penatex, um, there's some mushroom um, leathers happening right now that are not commercially available. And then cactus leather is the one that has become commercially available and that we put a focus on. I actually have a few samples here. so. This is a little handbag that we make. This is made out of cactus leather. Um, there's another little bag here. It, I mean, it, it looks just like leather. That's the reasoning why we, we've, we've gone for it because from a durability standpoint and functionality standpoint, um, cactus leather really does capture the same um, characteristics as leather. It is a blend of, of PU, so polyurethane plastics and, and, the, and the cactus material uh, plant itself um, is it the answer right now it's not but it's on the right steps to shifting the industry away from away from animal whatever and then on, on, on a, a call i think during this week you, you shook a lot lot of people by talking about bamboo and toxicity of bamboo in the uh, the, the fashion industry um, yeah which I, I think was a, a wake-up call to many and I think worth sharing here, if you could. Sure. So um, bamboo is um, it's a little bit of a catch-22. Um, as a designer myself, when I was looking for alternatives to kind of polyesters and nylons, we're always looking for organic alternatives. Um, I learned about bamboo can be can be made as a fabric, and um, I proposed to to my boss at the time, can we start sourcing bamboo and, and making backpacks and wallets? bamboo fibers and he told me that it's actually a very very toxic material um from a from a fiber standpoint and i was like how so because it's organic surely an organic material has the more chances of being compostable and biodegradable and that is the case but um with bamboo the way um the material is spun so from a spinning standpoint um it releases um a lot of hazardous chemicals into water systems and um, and um, it's very harmful to people who are working on the material from a spinning um, spinning the the actual fibers of the bamboo and and 
it's called rayon and then that rayon is very very hazardous and, and harmful to to humans and to waterways and um, it's just it's something that hasn't been tackled just yet from bamboo to, to find a very um, sustainable version of it um, ten cell would be the alternative to to using bamboo um, fibers um, ten cell is um, from a company called Lensing, and they found a, an approach where it's way more sustainable and um, non-harmful, and it's a way better solution to bamboo. So my advice to anyone, if you ever see a material, a fabric like linen, for example, like bed sheets, these types of things made from bamboo, um, try to avoid buying it and look for tensile or hemp instead. Yeah, th thanks for that. That, that was a, a wake-up call when I heard it. For sure. I yeah. mean, it's it's always tricky. It's hard to be to per to be perfect, and I mean, there's a lot of things I didn't know at the time, and I still obviously don't know everything. But um, it's just a learning curve, and uh, I mean, now everyone knows you can do your own research about why bamboo isn't um, sustainable, and there'll be many articles about the rayon process and whatnot. But um, it's just one of those, it's one of those catch 22s where just avoid bamboo from a fabric standpoint if you can. Indeed. And I think probably worth exploring whether bamboo should be on the red list for use within concrete and building materials. For sure. Um, and certainly an issue with uh, interior, interior design mm -hmm. that fabrics within buildings. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, just to pick up on a, another question. <clears throat> I think at the end of the video, you put out a call for people to get in involved um, based on collaboration and transparency. And I recall you saying you wanted to build the greenest factory on every continent with a huge 10, 20 year vision. Yeah. What sort of collaboration are you looking for, Joe? So I guess I could, I'll just dive into what our, our long-term goals are. Um, everyone kind of challenges me. Everyone says, why are you doing this in China? with China being obviously has a lot of negatives in the media from a climate change standpoint. Um, I didn't choose to for this to happen in China. The universe just made it happen for me. Um, it was a door that opened for me to make the biggest impact I could as a human. And it just so happened to be in China. Um, what people don't know is that China is a, a beautiful country, a fabulous place of incredible people. Um, it deserves the chance to be able to, um, to change um, from a government standpoint. They are making big changes to the country, but from an individual standpoint, there's a lot of love in that country. There's a lot of good things happening. Um, it's not all doom and gloom. People say, oh, made in China is a bad thing. For sure, there's a lot of bad, bad stigma out there, but um, it, it does deserve to, um, to have a chance to do great things they can do great things very quickly um so for us is our first goal is to um as i said right now we're, we're sharing a rental facility with a, with our current factory when you're in a rental facility we don't get the chance to really go above and beyond from a, from a building perspective we can't go in there and put like solar panels on the roof the landlord is responsible for doing those changes controlling the air conditioning and the electricity and the water again these are all things out of our control we're relying on the landlord to make these changes so our goal is to have that in our power and have that in our hands which is why we want to either um, restore a, a previous previous existing building and buy that and make that as green as possible or build a new factory from scratch in China and um, I mean at this stage it is a, it's a long-term goal but once we do do that I'm looking for anyone who wants to get on board this mission and um, support from just being part of um, our network. Um, the idea is to build a factory that we're all invested in it together. It, it, I like to call it the people's factory where anyone can invest, anyone can be a part of this building um, from, from physically working on it and building it or to giving advice or just supporting the mission. And then eventually, once we've done that in China, and we, we've built that cement piece, um, the one thing that I can't control from a manufacturing standpoint is, is carbon. Um, 
products. For example, if we have a if we have a brand in Europe who wants to get their bags made in China, from a carbon perspective from shipping, it's just something that's out of my control unless the shipping companies become greener. So I want to localize manufacturing um, per regions in the world. Um, there's some great interest in Central America right now in like Costa Rica to, to build a factory there, a vision in Costa Rica. We have a lot of American clients. We um, the cactus materials in Mexico. There's some great fabric suppliers in South America. Um, so to have a, a, a factory in Central America would make a lot of sense. Um, and then in Europe, there is possibility to, to, to build a vision within Europe. Um, Europe is pretty progressive in its, in its manufacturing already, but there is an opportunity right there to, um, to build a factory there. And um, so, yeah, just basically build these kind of incredible pieces of architecture all over, all over the world, um, localizing manufacturing, and just again, being a statement piece and hopefully other factories pick up on what we're doing and it empowers the change to, um, to, to, to change across the board. It's not all about us doing something incredible and taking all that business. It's about sharing your knowledge and sharing everything and collaboration is key to, to making these, these massive changes. It can't be in silos. It has to be done together. The, this capitalist world of us competing with each other needs to, to come to an end. I mean, we need to stop being at war with other brands and the market is so big where we can empower each other and both be just as profitable. I understand we have to be realistic when it comes to making money, but we need to shift that capitalism into, into conscious capitalism. And um, that can only be done by working together and not working against each other. I, I love the, uh, the expression used, the, the people's factory, the, the people's factory of China. It doesn't quite sound right, or does it? I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's more so the, world, the people of the world. And uh, I mean, that's another thing is that people say about it's made in China. But again, when you come back to meditation and the, and the universe, China is just a piece of land on one planet. This planet is shared by everyone. We had this thing as a human race to have all these divides about black, white, Asian, English, Irish, whatever. Like, end of the day, we're all just energy. We're all just the same people. And um, it's the planet's factory, really. A couple of other questions coming coming through from uh, Christina on the Q&A. And actually, a reminder for people to drop their questions um, onto the Q&A panel. Um, where can we get hold of these handbags? Is there a showroom somewhere? Um, no, we don't have a showroom in London. Um, I guess if you follow our Instagram, we'll be posting a lot of products from the brands we work with. We don't, we, we're not a brand ourselves. Um, the reason for that is that I, as a designer, I didn't see the, the need to, to build another brand. The world doesn't need any more brands right now. The world needs better manufacturing. There's loads of brands pre-existing. What they need is a place to get their product built in the most conscious, um, sustainable way as possible. Um, so we don't necessarily, we don't have the showroom ourselves. It will be loads of brands that we work with um, will have their own um, places that they will sell their goods. And if, if you follow us on Instagram and, and me on LinkedIn, I'll be resharing the brands that we work with. And the way you can support me is by supporting my clients um, and the clients we pick up are only sustainable vegan level clients, people that want to make the, make this change. And it's these, these are the brands that we want everyone to be supporting. So if you're supporting them, you're supporting us because they're going to have more business going to us. We have a lot of um, European companies now, um, a lot of Dutch, um, English brands. So if you follow us, you'll be able to find out who we're working with and um, basically um, you can support them. I, I see we've got about 100 people online at the moment. I'm sure most of those would want to contribute, support, get involved um, in, in one way or another. So maybe, Joe, when we finish talking, you could drop all those links, the Instagram, the Twitter, the, the websites, etc., into sure. the chat box, and we can, we can share those. Um, just a sort of final question very, very quickly, although it's a huge topic from Danielle. 
Daniel, sorry. Um, yeah, t taking back clothing in the fashion industry, the whole recycling circular economy. Have you got t two minutes to respond to that? What was the question? Uh, sorry, um, should that become mandatory? Circular economy within fashion, taking back clothing? Oh, for sure. I mean, I mean, the, the catch-22 for me is that I am making production. I'm making virgin pieces that are brand new to the planet. But my, stamp, my stance is, is to try and to eliminate the factories that are, are not doing things correctly, the, these kind of fast fashion factories that are pumping things out. We need to kind of fight that, um, that debate and ultimately we have to be realistic like this is the world we live in we are going to be making new things we are very entrepreneurial we are very innovative we do like to make things change however we need to slow down fashion and the way we can slow down fashion is if we are going to make new pieces make them better um they should be more expensive um they should be lasting longer um and then that product should hopefully be fully circular. Um, if it's a bag, for example, it is very challenging for, for backpacks and accessories to kind of enter that circularity because from an end of life, most of it ends up in landfill. Um, whereas in clothing, there are clothing that can degrade now quicker. Um, there are more options for kind of consignment stores and kind of secondhand shops. So. When it comes to clothing, my advice would be to always support secondhand shops, buying secondhand, reusing. Um, and then from a bag perspective, there's great initiatives out there, especially with companies like Patagonia, who encourage um, workshops to fix your product. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very mindful about working with brands who have this vision on circularity, because we, we both know that we are bringing, bringing a new product to the planet, but we want that product not to be like your seventh handbag in your closet, but your number one handbag. And if that breaks, there's a, there's a way to fix that. And then again, obviously, um, we're always putting, putting a focus on innovation with materials. Um, the cactus is a, is a great example of something that's on the right path. And then mushroom leather is not commercially available just yet, but these are the types of materials that designers will be able to start thinking more about cradle the cradle design thinking more circularity about when your bag is done can you put it into your back garden and can it compost and turn into vegetables like that's the that's where we need to be heading with, with anything we need to be thinking about can you just go plant a tree with your bag you know what i mean is it made of seeds there's seed paper out there from a paper perspective we need materials to be able to kind of degrade like this and then go back into back into the earth so yeah, I mean, it's, it's fundamental that we start thinking about the circular economy just now. Yeah, absolutely. Jerry, Jerry many, many thanks for sharing your, your, your stories and your vision, etc. I think it's a great reminder of how sometimes we see the built environment, design and construction as completely isolated from the, the, the real world um, in terms of business, in terms of the visions that, that you have. It's a, it's a great example of how we need to be working together and for learning sure. from one another. We're going to stay around, hopefully, for the, this morning, maybe maybe longer, and join in the, the, the next panel session. Definitely. Uh, maybe you could take uh, answer some questions which are popping up. I see there's one from Terry about crocodile farms. Morning, Terry. But uh, Joe, maybe you could respond to yeah, that. I mean, when you've got the crocodile farms is, um, it's pretty. It's pretty disappointing, to be honest. There's so much change happening this year, and then you see that happening in in Australia, and you're just like, wow. Yeah. But what can you say? I can, I'll answer that separately, though. Brilliant, thanks. And yeah, whilst Joe is around, please drop any questions in for Joey on the Q&A. Cool. Well, so, thanks and for having me and appreciate everyone hearing my story. And um, just one last note, um, anything is possible. Um, I'm no world beater. I'm just a regular guy. Um, just if you believe in something, um, just put yourself out there. Always be tenacious and um, the universe will, will handle will handle that stuff for you as long as you um you um you believe in something enough it will happen for you so um just yeah keep out there and stay positive don't um don't get too caught up of not being perfect right now it takes time to change and um just yeah just be as conscious as possible so
So m m moving on to WG1, Working Group 1. Um, it's a, a panel discussion for the next 30, 40 minutes or so. Um, and I, I've called this From Faro with, with Love. Um, and I'll explain why the with love bit at the moment, but Faro was one of the, the, the first um, working group uh, meetings that, that we had uh, three, four years ago. And it seems a long time ago, but uh, when I was looking back through the material, it's also very relevant. We could have written, written it today. We could have written it uh, tomorrow. Um, I'm gonna be joined by Blurter. Um, morning Blurter from, in Kosovo. Morning. morning. And Ebeltrod in, in Austria. Hello. Hi, morning, morning. And Jerry, you'll you stay with us, so I hope. Uh, so what I want to do initially is just open up um, and, and re recap some of the things from WG1, some of the thinking, and then we'll look at how we've started to apply that within um, within projects, within our life, within, within our, our thinking over the last three or four years, and then where we need to, to go from there. When we did meet in Faro, we had two or three uh, mini subgroups work, working. Um, and we combined all that um, output into a vision. So this was a vision for Restore. And we, we were hoping that this would uh, run all the way through uh, the, the, the working groups. And th that vision was well-being from love, sorry, well-being and love from awareness of the planet, that we really didn't have a true awareness of our planet. Um, and we'd only get there uh, yeah, th through improved uh, uh, awareness and through a, di a, a different worldview. We wanted to define some of the, the terms that we were using interchangeably at the time. We were using the word sustainability and restorative and regenerative it, it, to, to, to mean the same thing. So we needed to define what, what they were. And you can see here, um, these definitions, and I, I think this changed our, our thinking right through the restore four years. So sustainability was limiting impact. Uh, it's a balance point where we give back as much as we take. And Joey mentioned Patagonia earlier. We, we, we took an expression from Yvonne Schuno, the, the founder of Patagonia, who says that we should not be using the word sustainability until we're giving back more than we take. More than we take from the planet, more than we take from people more than we take from the communities that we're working in. And then moving on to re restorative, uh, which is about restoring the social, restoring the ecological systems back to a healthy state. And we, we talk about uh, healing the, the future. But then regenerative is going one step further and it's enabling those systems to thrive. So creating the conditions around those ecosystems where, where, where they can thrive. We saw this slide from Carlo in the, in the introduction uh, within Working Group One. We sort of uh, took a lot of thinking from ILFI and from, from, from other gurus and saw sustainability or the word sustainable as a bridge between being degenerative and being regenerative. Anything that is not sustainable is harming the planet. Anything that is not sustainable is harming people. And by only reducing impact, we're probably not doing justice to where we want to be. So we may need to make that flip into restorative, into regenerative, where we're, we're talking about the, the positive good. Um, and we use for a while the expression of, we don't have the luxury just to be less bad. We need to be doing positive good in, in, in everything we do within our buildings, within our lifestyles, et cetera. And um, we spent a lot of time in Faro and uh, Sofia and other wonderful cities around Europe, um, really exploring the language of sustainability. And either the language can be inspirational and it can encourage us to do fantastic things. But sadly, it's become a mask that we and many organizations and projects can hide behind. You know, we, we think about greenwash, we think about all the confusion out there. 
And I, I love the uh, little expression I put down the, the, the bottom here, which actually comes from Paul Hawkins from his uh, Project Drawdown book. Yeah, the confuser says that calling things by their proper name is the beginning of wisdom. Brilliant. But then Paul Hawkins, in the world of climate change, this can be the beginning of confusion. And I think it's something we, we, we've struggled with all the way through the restore. We have different definitions of carbon neutrality. We have different definitions of carbon net positive. Uh, so we, we still have that uh, confusion. And whilst we do have that confusion, organizations and people can hide, hide behind that. For me, one of the, the big things which came out of Faro and uh, all, all the way through is this realization of the expression of SIVA, um, which I'll, I'll get to in a moment. But we can look at our journey uh, through, through sustainability, if you like. And we can go back to Industrial Revolution, where we, we had dominion over, uh, well, we thought we had dominion over nature and over people. We took what we wanted and dumped what we didn't. Um, we took more than we wanted. Uh, we took more than we wanted from the planet. We took more than we wanted from, from people. Um, and we, we know all about the uh, abusive slave, modern slavery, or, sorry, ancient slavery, industrial revolution slavery at, at the time. We, we then moved into a, an eco period, which we can roughly define as the last 30 to 40 years. And maybe it's the Brentland definition which kicks up that off in 1987 which, as we all know, is to do nothing today which compromises tomorrow's generation. But that hasn't really moved the needle. And we need that different mindset and that different mindset of Siva. Siva is a fantastic Sanskrit word, um, which means living in harmony, doing things in service, but doing all that without reward, without direct reward, without payment reward, or spectrum reward. It, we do it because we're part of nature, not apart from nature. And the, the, the quotation along the, the, the bottom there um, comes from Ed Gillespie. And I think that really sums up Siva in the world, that the planet doesn't need to be saved or rescued or changed, it needs to be loved. And it's not a spreadsheet checks and balances. It's, uh, it's joy, it's mutual appreciation, and it's a, it's a partnership. And we need to move to that. And just to illustrate, illustrate why that eco period hasn't moved the needle, if we plot onto there, you know, th th this is um, temperature increases since 1900 or so, but this could be carbon increase, this, this could be lots of things. That white band is the eco period in the time scale of this little chart. And I've plotted on there my time scale, it could be your time scale. E even though many of us have been working within sustainability for the last five, 10, in my case is 30, 40 years or so, we haven't achieved anything and we're actually leaving the future generations with a bigger problem than we inherited back in whenever. So we, we really need to, to think, think differently. As an outcome from the, uh, the, the Restore Working Group 1, we identified a number of triggers and we'll, we'll ex explore these with a, a few case studies in, in a few moments. But um, four case, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the four triggers here are ed education and people who read the Build and Research Journal this month will we'll see we're not really addressing uh, the education to you know, pro provide people, um, architects, uh, project managers, et cetera, which can deal with the, the climate crisis that we're in at the moment, the ecological crisis. And yet education is the most important action we can take um, to, to, to address these. And you know, from a restore perspective, this should be what we're good at. And maybe we are failing. And when we talk about nature, um, we desperately need that worldview that sees ourselves as, as part of nature. Yet we still see nature as a resource we still see nature as something to combat, to, to conquer. Um, we, we, we still see it as something out of fear. We, we don't have that love. We don't have that real connectivity with nature. When it comes, we may have it in our own lifestyle, but when it comes to designing or constructing, we certainly don't. We also identified uh, place as a, a, a key trigger. Um, and this is a recognition 
of the history, the ancestral history, the indigenous the culture, the geography, the bio um, climatic conditions, all that importance of a place. And yet we think we can just dump a building it anywhere and, and it will work. And as, as we're seeing from around the world, that the whole awareness of indigenous um, and cultural aspects is incredibly important. And then with Restore, you know, the, the rethinking uh, sustainability towards a regenerative economy, eco the change in economy had to be a big trigger uh, and a trigger to a socially just regenerative e economy and making that transition process itself really just. So they, 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 those were the, uh, the, the four triggers. And I'd, I'd just like to sort of uh, pull in Lurta and uh, Edeltraud and Joey and just for initial comments on your sort of reflections of WG1 all the way back in Faro and the triggers, whether you have any comments. Yeah, hello from my side, maybe I can start. First of all, I would like to thank Joy for his really very impressive uh, story about his work. And I, I, what I was so impressed is that he also um, put focus on collaboration and the high level of consciousness and you combine it with a very sustainable way to produce products. And um, to your question, Martin, about these four triggers, as you said in the beginning, uh, if I look back, me too, I think that they all four of them are still very relevant. And but what I, and what I would say, it's also not relevant one by one, but it's also very relevant to see them in a holistic way. We need a much more interdisciplinary way of thinking, yeah, not only think about the economy or only education, but we need all of them. And uh, I think that's that's the the critical point, yeah, that we still have a lot of <coughs> in silos, yeah. So that's, uh, for me, the, the most uh, important uh, aspect. Thank you, Edel Trott. It's been really good fun working with you over the four years and hopefully that, that will continue. And likewise with yourself, Lurta. Yeah. Yes. Thoughts uh, of early days? I would also like to thank Joey for his uh, example. It's a really good example, which he has to... I would encourage him to facilitate the example to educate, 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 uh, because uh, it's not about uh, sustainability. It's not about only professionals anymore. It has to be um, uh, spread it to everyone since uh, uh, primary school to, to elder, elderly people. So everybody has to contribute in saving our planet, not only uh, professionals anymore. Thank you. Joey, what was you with us on the? Um, uh, any thoughts on, on the, the, these triggers? Would you add anything else in there? Or no, I mean they all just they all work. One isn't on its own important. They all work so well to with each other, and they're already they're all just fundamental, aren't they? I mean education is pretty much where we're at right now. It's just we need to make sure education is is crucial, especially with the, the kids generations coming up today that I mean they are ultimately the change makers um we have a, a fresh light of of souls and minds to to change before they get scarred by what society tells them is correct so and then yeah I mean nature it's we really need to kind of understand that we all live as one on this planet and right now there's that stigma of nature is this tangible thing that's separated to what society is but we are part of nature everything is part of nature so we need to work with it um i think i saw a quote from you about the planet isn't going to change and um it's something to do with the, the, we just need to love it we need to love the planet rather than fix it and, and that's a, there's a lovely quote about just basically just just loving loving nature and then once we do that everything will just kind of radiate from from all those types of things so definitely i mean these are all very important triggers thanks what one of the uh, 
most inspirational project I, I visited, which is actually the beginning of this year. In fact, a week before the the, the lockdown, I think I, I escaped back from Kosovo just 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 in time. Um, was the Kosovo t- TV studios? Um, yeah. I, that, that addresses a, a, a number of these, but it, it, it particularly the, the place and the history. Yeah, that's the thing I took. From. And I'm not sure, Blurita, if your background is are you in the Kosovo TV studios at the moment? Or? Uh, no, no, I'm in the office right now, okay. but we are, we, it looks very similar. <laughs> we, yeah. uh, we are lucky to have this example actually and uh, in Kosovo and to show it to, uh, to all the guests, let's say. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, maybe we can see a short video before the, uh, uh, I, I would explain a little bit the project. Yeah, okay. I'll launch it now. Here we go. So as you can uh, see, and as uh, Martin explained it uh, earlier, uh, this was uh, um, the request for the from the uh, company from for for the architect was to uh, design a TV studio, TV studios and a cultural center. Uh, in the, and the place uh, given was a, a car suspenders factory, an old car suspenders factory. So the architect was in between two uh, two choices, to destroy the the entire building and to start it from the scratch, or to reconstruct it. And they chose to do the second one. So what you can see, maybe the the pictures are a little bit smaller here. Uh, most of the materials from the building were from the old building have been used 
uh, like uh, um, ch chandeliers have been used to have been um, uh, redesigned and used for as, a, as a lighting fixtures or radiators and the heating system has been used from the from the previous building um, the um, bricks it's it, it's very very interesting because the bricks uh, you can see a little bit i can i i, I cannot move the uh, the uh, mouse on the on the screen but maybe martin can show you where the uh, the uh, the wall with the bricks the wall is uh, 60 meters long and it uh, goes up to four meters in two different floors so it's eight meters and it's covered with the bricks from the um, for from the uh, destroyed houses during the war so the uh, the uh, leftover bricks from these houses have been uh, taken uh, cleaned and used uh, to bring some memory in the building. Um, the facade of the building, uh, maybe in the next slide, it's the facade of the building have been uh, covered uh, with the sleepers from the railway. So the sleepers from the railway were, have been not, were not in use anymore. They have taken, they have been uh, uh, cleaned and uh, re uh, redesigned, let's say, in a, a smaller wooden plates. And uh, the entire facade is uh, it's covered with the, with, with the wooden material from the railways. Uh, the internal, uh, the internal uh, walls, uh, you have also seen a part in the video where um, uh, where um, uh, from the from the cultural center and uh, cultural center the walls in the cultural center have been uh, um, designed with the wooden sticks uh, so it's all uh, made of uh, um, let's say it's um, craft work uh, a lot of crafting work have been done in this building and uh, the ceiling is from bush bushes, so not a lot of ready to use or, or ready to buy materials have been used. Uh, uh, for example, not everybody have been convinced that bush bushes would uh, cover all the all, uh, all the elements or all the requirements from ac acoustics um, uh, uh, part of the building that required from the building to to cover uh, will be. Uh, done but uh, engineers have come into uh, into uh, let's say conclusion that uh, 80 centimeters of bushes uh, will cover it very well or will done their job very well um this is one of the uh, one of the buildings that uh, um, uh, let's say have uh, initially have been calculated to cost around 8 million euros but ended up to uh, uh, after uh, a lot of things have been redesigned from the first uh, from the first uh, um, uh, idea let's say uh, it cost is it, it costed around two million and it's one of the landmarks that we use uh, to um, uh, there are a lot of details inside uh, but a, a lot of natural uh, na natural materials uh, have been used but uh, I, I would not take a lot of time to uh, to in introduce everything. Uh, you can I, I will uh, encourage you to watch the entire video. It's a, a, it's something around 50 minutes, and it's in YouTube. I can I can share with you the link of the uh, the longer video, and it's a very good uh, uh, documentary video uh, how every uh, natural material have been uh, uh, let's say facilitated to to be used in the interior and in the, in the on the exterior of the building it's amazing thank you well, thanks uh, for sharing it's, that. It's, it's 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 much better if you see it from the uh, from closer that like uh Marcus, martin has done it but uh, I, I guess you will have you will what's have the, a chance what's the square foot total uh what's the excuse total me? square feet or square meters uh, it's. Uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly, but I will check it and I will write it on the. Uh, it's two two floor buildings. Uh, if I'm not wrong, it's. Uh, I'll I'll give you the exact number in a few minutes. And this it's one I'm of the. 
it's one of the uh, buildings has which has won a lot of uh, national and international awards and so it should i mean this is how i want to build the factory just like reusing what's available i mean when you said those numbers from eight million to two million it's like yes yes definitely that's it's incredible good. that that the change you can save just from just thinking outside the box really and i mean yeah, it's it's so it's so inspirational it's amazing on, and on that scale yeah. as well like if you can build a building that big it's it's excuse if, if i'm houses. not if I'm not wrong, it's something around 12 uh, uh, TV studios and there is a theater and uh, all the um, all the other, let's say, uh, spaces for the cultural center, like ex exhibition for art and uh, stuff like this. But it's, it's quite a big building. When was it complete? In 2016. Okay. And how long did it take to, um, how long was the project totally? Um, two, two years. Two years, that's amazing. Two years. Wow. There's still work going on at the moment with an extension for the... It, it, yes, for the cultural center. It's yeah. uh, almost done. It has to be um, uh, inaugurated in um, during before pandemics, but be, because of the... They want to do... They want to have a big uh, event there, which cannot be handled right now, but it will be... I, I, I hope it will happen soon. Yeah. And, and I recall that was going to be streamed live. So look, look forward to, yes. uh, to, to, to watching that. And um, I, I think it's just a, a brilliant example. I know you're involved in it, but it's a brilliant example of how we can start start to apply some of the, the, the thinking from, from Restore into the, the real world. Yeah. And just on one sort of clarification, I know one thing I took away from the, the visit is the etching into the light diffusers. Uh, yes, yes, uh, the light diffusers are, uh, I, I would say they are one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, only materials that have been built <laughs> and uh, used there. Uh, the light diffusers are, uh, um, I don't know if you can go back to the video, but if it, it, it's not possible, it's, it's okay. The light diffusers are also used for acoustics and uh, they are uh, transparent when the light is off. So you can see the bushes of the ceiling. And uh, when they are on, they have some dots. There is a wonderful text, which I have been um, um, honored to read it <laughs> from the architect. And they have written uh, um, with a Morse code, there is a, a wonderful text on how the uh, how the artist feels when he's or she is on the on the stage of the of the that theater. Yeah, I, I think that's just absolutely amazing that that level of detail to etch in yeah. Morse code into the light so, diffusers. So the seventy two light diffusers and the the entire text of uh, four or five pages, uh, it's written there. And uh, in order to understand, for everybody has to bring seventy two lights together. <laughs> An orchestra, and was the previous was the previous building um, dormant? Was it unoccupied for a amount of years? Like the no, actual... no, it was it was an, an an empty building for many years, so it was not it was not in use. And was the, structurally was there many issues? Because I mean, no, it's... the structure was okay. The structure was very very good, and that's why they they have decided to use it. Uh, and to reconstruct it, otherwise it will may, maybe it will be costing more to to uh, uh, to redesign, let's say, the structure. But as long as they could use the structure, it was easier to to yeah. work only in, on the interior and exterior. I'll keep an eye could, out. In China. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to move on to Edelton, um, and maybe we could keep that conversation going through Discord or through the. Uh, uh, the, the, the chat box, box yeah. but yeah please if you have any questions for what we're talking about in this session please do drop them into the the q a or into the uh, chat box edeltraud I, I know you've been using work from wg1 in in, in your work do, do you want to just, just t take us through how you've been doing so uh, hello oh yeah yeah that's the slide now uh, thank you very much also platter for this beautiful example um i just when 
Martin asked me to think about maybe one slide for this conference. I remembered when we started Restore four years ago, I just had completed the research about low-tech architecture, and this was maybe one of my main um, main focus why it was quite interesting for me to join this Restore action. And uh, so um, I still kept this thinking that we need to reduce um, technology because uh, uh, a lot of technology has to be produced, but uh, it, uh, we, need, we need a different way of thinking. And this uh, example, that's an example from India. It was built for uh, homeless children, 2008 and 2010. And I think it shows, uh, it's just built out of uh, clay and then it's burned. Uh, and when it's burned, uh, they also put some ceramic products inside. So it's not only the houses that are made by this process, but they also produ produce new new products um, within. So um, I think it, it's just a very good example that shows the four triggers that Martin has announced before, like for example, for education, this is a good example to teaching people traditional and local building methods. For nature, of course, they use uh, local resources and also the construction are very well in harmony with nature. For place, of course, they use local resources and they don't need long transport routes. And for economy, I think it's also a very good example for circular economy, because, for example, also the interior space is used as an oven and uh, to burn other clay products. So um, uh, this, uh, I found this, uh, this was one of the pro projects I was very impressed, yeah, because it's also from an architectural point of view. It's not only the social aspect, but also from an architectural point of view. I think it fits very well with the nature and the place yeah, and how it's, uh, how it is produced. So uh, that's why I have cho chosen this specific project. That's great, thanks. And, and I just love how, yeah, the, the, the work from WG1, from those triggers and from the, the book that we put together yeah. have rippled out uh, to, to Kosovo around the world and these type of projects, it's, it's amazing, yeah. Um, I just wanted to share some thoughts from the uh, Curtin Valley project here in Lancashire in, in the UK. Um, many people will recall that this was the, the a site visit during the, the very first training school, um, which we held in, in Lancaster. And, and I think when we did visit back in 2017, um, there was very little structure there. Um, and the, the project opened last year, is incredibly successful. And in terms of regenerative economy, it has increased the uh, footfall to the park by, by 400%, by, by a factor of four. Unfortunately, it closed this year. Um, not not closed, but you know, it was closed during the uh, the, uh, the the lockdown. Um, and hopefully, we've, the UK has come out of a lockdown today, yesterday. So hopefully, it will open again before Christmas. But it's a really vibrant place to visit. It's really, really buzzing and full. Um, and we pulled a lot from um, the, uh, the the restore thinking into here. So it's biophilic. We started with biophilic workshop. It's a carbon sink. It's a timber building, straw bale building. Um, and the straw came locally and all the timber, uh, most of the timber was grown on, on the site. Um, yeah, it's plant-based materials. So it's, it's a lot of uh, lime. Um, it's a lot of uh, straw bale, etc. And uh, as you probably know, I've mentioned numerous times um, that there is zero cement and zero concrete in, in the building. In terms of circular economy, we, we talked about this a few times this morning already, but we can take the building apart. We can reassemble it if we want to, we can reuse bits. Um, we think some around 18, 90% we could compost. I, we could put back into the earth, we could put back into, into the ground. Uh, and the remainder, the, the technical bits like the glazing could actually be recycled or they can be 
unbolted and, and reused. Uh, for those familiar with the Living Building Challenge, that the building is red list free. Uh, we spent a lot of time making sure that no nasty toxics or chemicals, nasty chemicals, um, got 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 into into the building. Uh, we're, we're working on net zero energy. The energy is provided by solar panels um, in a barn, be, so on the roof of the barn, be, behind th this one, uh, and we're using ground source heating. And if, if you're to, to visit during the summer. The, the grass you see there in the uh, forefront is, is actually used for uh, gra grazing cattle, happy cattle, I should say, Joey, and the uh, and occasionally sheep. Um, being a living building challenge project, we're, we're now going through the uh, certification. Uh, it's taken a, a little longer than usual. We're sort of fine tweaking that, but hopefully it will become a certified living building challenge project very soon. I'm just thinking, Blurta Edeltroy, did, did you visit this for the very first training school? I know Edeltroy, you, you were there. Yeah, I have seen it. Yes, it was really very impressive. Very nice example. And to, to, to fit in what we were also talking about a few moments ago, um, part of that, that training school, we, we had a, uh, uh, a session from the architect, Barbara Jones, but we also had a session on mindfulness. Uh, because when we started the, the, this project, um, when we did the biophilic workshops, etc., we held a few sort of uh, um, introduction to um, mindfulness uh, for, for the, the, the project team and the designers to get people into the, 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 the correct or a, a suitable mindset to, to, to approach the, the design of these type of buildings. Okay, I found this on the web. Don't you hate it when? Siri picks up something you're saying and tries to find it on the web. Sorry about that. Okay. We'd like to sort of move on to talk about where we go from here. Um, WG1, it has rippled through the, the, the other working groups. But I'd like to just show a, a video. Um, and I do apologize, well, maybe apologize, but that there is flashing imagery, a lot of flashing imagery in, in this video. This could be the most important minute of your day. We have been through difficult times and face big problems ahead. But every crisis contains both danger and opportunity. You can play your part. Right now. Right now. Please close your eyes. Imagine, Imagine the better future we could have. Imagine that future. What does it look like for you? For the people you love. How do we lift each other up and make it fair? How do we protect nature and save our shared home? Picture that picture you want. Now open your eyes. It's time to talk about the future we want. Pretty powerful. Uh, now time to talk about the, 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 the future we want. Um, I don't know if anyone saw a, a, a fantastic article by Aradate Roy in the Financial Times um, and many other outlets uh, back, back in April, where she described the, uh, uh, the pandemic as a portal and we're passing through that portal and with the news of vaccines arriving in the UK today, we're, we're actually seeing the other side of the, of the portal. Um, the support between one world and another, and we can choose what we take through it, all, all the good stuff that we want to take through it and leave all the bad stuff behind, you know, dead rivers and smoky skies and all that stuff, which the, the built environment is 40% of. Um, and also in, involved in some organisations, etc., which I've started to look at COP26, which meets in the UK in November of next year. And I contributed to a, a, a launch, a countdown launch, uh, November of this year, 12 months ahead. And the, uh, the, the keynote speaker at the, the beginning mentioned this. You know, are we brave enough? Are we bold enough, disruptive enough, clever enough, and passionate enough to really go forward to the future that, that, that we want? 
So one of the um, final actions of Restore is to ask that question, where do we go from here? Restore from 2016 to 2020 has been the uh, to create a paradigm shift. Now, what if a city actually made that, that paradigm shift? We'd like you to, to help us in, imagine what that city would look like. So we, we've taken the expression and get that's restored, which is the name of the small city in, in Europe, which has done that and it's moved forward. What, so what would that look like in 10 years time? So it's time for us to uh, talk about the, the, the future we, we want. It, it always seems as though it's just over the horizon, as Robin Wall has said numerous times. The question is how we get there.